You are invited to Ozark Full Gospel Church, located in Ozark, Missouri, where we are touching the Ozark with Jesus Christ. Sit back and enjoy as Pastor James Aiken brings forth God's exciting word. Heaven's glory soon away. With time is filled with swift transition. Not a word unmoved can stand. Bet your hope on things eternal. And hold to God unchanged. Dude. 
God unchanging hand I hold to God unchanging hand Build your hope with me this morning hold to God changing hand hold to God a changing hand build your I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to St. Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. Amen. Praise God. This verse 4, um, Jesus has shared, preached the Word of God, and he did it from a ship, Simon Peter's ship. And after he had shared the Word of God, he said in verse 4, Now when Jesus had left speaking... He said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught or a great big catch of fish. I want you to notice the phrase, launch out into the deep. I want to use for a subject this morning, go in deep. Go in deep. You may be seated. Now notice, I didn't say go out deep. I said go in deep. And I believe with all my heart that the deepness, the depths of God will bring wonderful, multiplied blessings to our life. The Bible says that there were two ships uh, just standing there idle at the Lake Gennesaret, same as the Sea of Galilee. If you notice in some places it'll say Gennesaret or a sea of Galilee in different places in the Bible. I think there's three different names from Tiberias and then Genesaret and then Galilee. And it's actually the same place. It is the Sea of Galilee. And the reason they use Genesaret is because around that is Genesaret, uh, a village, and it was in the different bodies of water in the Sea of Galilee. And it was at this place that uh, two ships were there. One ship was the property of Simon Peter. The other ship was the property of James and John, the two sons of Zebedee. And Jesus requested that he would use Simon Peter's boat and to launch out into the water just a little ways so that Jesus could use that as an amplification to be able to articulate and share the great word of God as it raced and as it ricocheted, as it bounced, as it uh, like a skip a rock across the water. Anybody ever done that? Skip a rock across the water. The voice of God would just echo across. Now Jesus didn't have to do that because Jesus is, is God and his voice is amplified anyway, but he did it so that I think uh, he wanted that, that camp meeting atmosphere, that open air atmosphere, and he had it, amen. How many would like to went to a camp meeting where Jesus was speaking? Wouldn't that be incredible? I've been to some camp meetings and Jesus wasn't speaking. But anyway, <laughs> I don't want to be critical, but I just want you to understand that this is the incredible, uh, amazing God, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. And so Jesus asked Peter to launch out and he would use that ship as a place in which he would teach the word of God. When he was done, now these two ships were standing idle at the, the Lake Genesaret, and there they were washing their nets. They were cleaning them up. They were done. They had fished all night. They were getting ready to go home. And Jesus launches out, shares the word of God, and then after he shares the word of God from Peter's boat or his ship, he said, Peter, launch out into the deep. 
Launch out into the deep. Let down your nets in the deep water and you'll find you'll get a great big catch of fish. Now, Peter reluctantly said, uh, Master, we have toiled all night and we have taken nothing, but nevertheless, at thy word, we'll launch out, we'll let down our net, and, uh, and he did. Peter launched out, let down his net, and when he let down his net, the net got so full of fish that it be it break, the Bible says. And I, I would venture to say that a part of the net broke. If you know anything about net fishing, you know that it can break and still bring in fish. And so it broke, and it was so full of fish that uh, they had to call uh, James and, and John, the sons of Zebedee, to bring their ship, and they got got so many fish at the voice of Jesus Christ that when they filled the boat with fish, it, they filled both ships with fish and both ships started to sink. Now that's a heap of fish, amen. That's quite a fish story. Amen, come on now. And so I want you to understand this. This is beautiful because Jesus Christ said, go out there and fish where you fished all night because Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, we fished all night and taken nothing. We have fished all night, we're weary, we're tired, we wanna go home, but nevertheless at your word, we'll let down the net. And he did, and I mean, no, if you'll listen to Jesus Christ, he'll bless your life. I hey, listen to me. If you'll listen to Jesus Christ, he'll bless your life. And Jesus Christ said, go into the deep. Launch out into the deep, go deep. And I want you to understand that, that though they launched out into the deep waters, the nets went deep down to where they caught a tremendous amount of fish. I want you to understand today that the days of trying to serve God in shallow water are over. We've got to go deep because in the deep waters, you will find the blessings of God. Go deep. Now notice I didn't say go out it says, go in deep. The phrase in deep is a statement that I want you to listen to because the greatest blessings are in the deep. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 10 says, the treasures of the deep. It says, it says, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now, how many in this room would like to have some deep things of God? Amen some deep things of God. And I just wanna go through this real quickly and, and, and look, at, uh, look at an outline. Uh, first of all, we see God's gracious offer, go deep. And God's offer is to everyone in this room, go deep. And you're not gonna get any deeper than getting in Jesus Christ. All the blessings are in Jesus Christ. I'm saved because I'm in Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian and you're saved, it's because you're in Jesus Christ. You can't go no deeper than that. Get in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and God will bless your life, amen. God's gracious offer is get in him. Go deep into his blessing. Get in Jesus Christ. And I want you to, we've got a, we've got a little chihuahua. Actually, we don't at our house because Judy has moved to her new house, but a little dog named Clint, and his name is Clint Eastwood. Now, I didn't name the dog. I don't know who named the dog, but I feel so sorry for the dog. Clint Eastwood. And Clint Eastwood doesn't want to go outside except when he wants to go outside. And when you get him to go outside, he'll go out and, and then he'll come in. And if he don't want to go outside, he hides under the bed. He hides in the closet. He runs and he hides. He's nowhere to be found. Well, I want you to know, I got in Jesus Christ. And now that I'm in Jesus Christ, I ain't getting out. I'm staying in. You're not gonna sweep me out from under the bed. I'm in Jesus to stay. I'm going nowhere. I'm gonna stay in the blessing of Jesus Christ because someday I'm gonna go somewhere beyond the blue. I'm going to heaven because I'm in Jesus Christ. Amen, come on now. And so God gives us a gracious offer, go deep. Simon Peter has a humbling confession when he get, they get the fish. It says in verse five, and Simon answered and said unto Jesus, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. That's a humbling confession. 
Peter, James, and John were fishermen. And Peter gives this humbling confession, we have toiled all night, professional fishermen, and taken nothing. That's a humbling confession. I want you to know that many in this room, though we're not talking about fishing per se at the river or the lake, you would have to say concerning your life, you have toiled all your life and taken nothing. There's people in this room, you have toiled and you are not where you want to be. It's a humbling confession. And I want you to know when man realizes that he is a one great big this, he needs to number one, his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You know, if you, take, if you take one and put a zero in front of that one, you've got a 10. If you put another zero in front of that one, you've got a 100. You got another zero and put in front of that, you've got a 1,000. And I want you to know, if all the zeros behind that are nothing, but once you get in with Jesus Christ, I put my zero there with the big one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and I put Don's zero there and Terry's zero there and Lenny's zero there and Jerry's double O zero there, my double O zero, and we put the, boy, Jesus gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Jesus gets more awesome, more, more amazing, more thrilling. And I, Peter says, uh, humbly, he says, we, we toiled all night and taken nothing. And Jesus Christ had already told them, launch out into the deep. He had already told Peter, launch out for a, a, a catch. And so Peter says, um, I'm going to honor God. I'm going to honor the voice of Jesus Christ. He said, nevertheless, at thy word, we will let down the net. I will let down the net. And I want you to know, we're here to honor Jesus Christ, to glorify Jesus Christ. Simon Peter's great humiliation, after they bring in the boatload of fish, after Peter sees all this thing, and by the way, at the beginning of this story, Peter is always referred to as Simon in the beginning. But here in the middle of it, after they catch the great big catch of fish, and after Peter sees who he is, they name him Simon Peter. Now there's a reason he's called just Simon at the start and then he's called Simon Peter here in this next verse. The reason he's called Simon Peter is because they wanted you to know that even the great apostle Peter, even the great, great uh, 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 Pentecost speaker, uh, the day of Pentecost, that great Peter, even him, he has to deal and reckon with his sin. Mark 3, 16, Jesus said, your name Simon. He said, he surnamed Peter. Now in Luke 5, 8, you have Simon Peter's humi uh, great humiliation. He, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at his knees, at Jesus' knees, saying, depart from me, for I am crucified. I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me, I am a sinful man, O Lord. And I want you to know that that was the last thing that, that Simon Peter should have asked. You, the last thing you should ask is depart from me, Jesus. That's the last thing you ought to say. One of the last things you, you should do is say, oh, I'd go to church, but the roof would fall in. We got insurance, come on. And, and if we don't renew our insurance, we'll get hard hats, come on. Come on. I've never been in a church where the roof fell in, but I do read in the Bible in Mark chapter 2 where the roof fell in. They were lowering a sick of palsy down to the feet of Jesus Christ. And by the way, I want you to know that um, the roof might fall in, but it won't be because uh, of you being a sinner. Uh, it, a person being a sinner, the foundation will fall out from under you, but the roof won't fall in if you're a sinner. And Peter says to him, depart from me. He says to Jesus, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. The last thing you need to do right now in this room is to walk away from the, the offer that Jesus Christ has for you. The very last thing you should do is to walk away from Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is your only hope. He's your, he's your only way. He's the only 
a person that can bring you through. And, and here's what Jesus Christ said to Simon Peter when he said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He says to him in verse 10 and 11, pretty much go deep with God. I have freedom. And I want you to know, you can go deep with God and have freedom. Verse 10 and 11, Luke 5, and Jesus said unto Simon, fear not, fear not. From henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and they followed him. Now I want you to know that we live for God today in the person of Jesus Christ. We look to him, we trust him. And because of Jesus, we can hear the words, fear not. Because of Jesus, we are free to live a life of joy and happiness. We're free to overcome sin, hell, and the grave through the person of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ said to Peter, when he said, depart from me, O Lord, I'm a sinful man, Jesus Christ said, fear not, fear not. I want you to know, that Jesus Christ says to everyone in this room, fear not, fear not. I'm gonna free you, Jesus Christ says, Peter. I'm gonna free you, Peter, of your guilt and shame and sin. I'm gonna loose you and I'm gonna set you free and I'm gonna wash you and cleanse you and make you a fisherman of men. I'm gonna take you forward and you're gonna follow me and you're gonna follow me all the way to glory. You're gonna follow me to heaven. You're gonna follow me all the way home. Peter, you're gonna follow me and you're gonna work for me and you're gonna honor me because I'm gonna take care of your sin in the past. Now I want to say this. We have freedom. John chapter 8 verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye are free indeed. Are you listening to me? And I want to say there is freedom from the guilt of sin. Listen to me. There's freedom from the guilt of sin. Sin makes you feel bad. At first, sin is pleasure. At first, sin feels good. But after you sin, you feel really bad. It's kind of like being on a diet and you go to a buffet and you eat all you want and then you feel really bad. It's kind of like being on a diet and you want to lose weight and you, you, you succumb to this big, luscious looking snicker bar. You eat it and it's so good. But after you eat it, you feel so bad. Come on. Because you failed. And let me tell you, sin, sin might feel good when you're doing it, but when you're done, you're going to feel bad about it. Sin brings guilt and condemnation to one's life. And the Son can set you free. The Son can make you free. free. Jesus Christ can make you free. Listen to what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Anybody had things against you? I have. And it says, those things that was against us, which was con contrary to us, and took it out of the way. Jesus took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. That guilt and shame, that sin, that weakness upon me, Jesus Christ took it to the cross of Calvary and took it away. Away with my death, away with my sin, away with my guilt. Jesus took it to the cross and nailed it to the cross and died my hell, died my death, died my guilt, and Jesus made me free. I want to say you need to dig deep in Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1, there is therefore now. Everybody say now. There is therefore now. Everybody say now. No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Everybody say, wow. See, there's the now, and then there's the wow. There is therefore now no condemnation. Now no guilt. Now no shame. Now no power of sin, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Wow. Woo! Walking after the Spirit of God. I just trust my Jesus. Freedom from the dominion of sin. Romans chapter 8, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ. There's that word in again. Notice you find that word in, 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 in. I want to say go in deep. Go in deep where Jesus is. Go in deep to the Son of God. 
I didn't say go in deep to the church. Didn't say go in deep to Sunday school. Didn't say go in deep to any ritual. Said go in deep to Jesus Christ. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Listen to me. Dig in deep and live the spirit of life. Live in the spirit of life. Go in deep. Go in deep. Trust Jesus Christ. Love Jesus Christ. Honor Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ will give you freedom from the dominion or the power of sin. That, that, that thing, that thing that keeps hanging on, that sin that keeps hanging on, that burden that keeps hanging on, that past that keeps hanging on, that trial that keeps hanging on, that takes you into the looming darkness of the past, those guilt and that shame that just keeps hanging on, that habit of sin that keeps hanging on, just move in, dig deep, go in deep, go in deep, move in deep, launch out into the deep, get down deep in Jesus Christ and experience the spirit of life. The world, is, the, the world is dying in the spirit of death, but we are living in the spirit of life. Oh, I tell you what, I'm so grateful for the fact that the spirit of God just takes care of all my problems and all my troubles as I realize that I dig in deep and live the spirit of life. Did you know to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ actually means to rely on Jesus? Do you know that? In Acts 16, 31, Paul and Silas says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. To the jailers. Said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thine house. The word believe there means to rely. We could read it like this. Rely on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. I'm relying on the Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes time to stand before God, bow before God, crawl before God, lay on my face before God, I want you to know that I'm gonna be relying on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I'm gonna rely on the goodness of God, the mercy of God. I'm gonna be buried down deep in the person of Jesus Christ, in the work of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know today that that love of God still penetrates our life as we're children of God and I'm free, freedom, freedom, freedom that, that only God can give, freedom from our guilt, freedom from our, uh, the powers of sin. And then I wanna say there's freedom from fear, freedom from the fear of the unknown. Freedom from the fear of the unknown. Second Timothy chapter one, verse seven, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Are oh, you listen to me? First Peter chapter five, verse seven, casting all your care upon him because he careth for you. I have freedom from the fear of the unknown. Someone says, I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what's gonna happen. Well, I want you to know when it comes time for this body to lie down and go to sleep, I know exactly what's gonna happen because I've been redeemed in the blood of the lamb according to the scriptures in, in Luke chapter 16, an angel will come and an angel will sweep me up in his arms and carry me to be with Jesus Christ. I know exactly to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. I know exactly what's gonna happen. I know, I have no fear of the future. Future. I have no fear of what's going to happen. I, there is the, the future is not unknown with me. Oh, sure, I don't know what I'm going to have for supper tonight. I don't know what I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow. Oh, sure, I don't know how, what is going to happen tomorrow or what's going to happen next week, but I am not afraid of the unknown. I know that I'm redeemed in the blood of Jesus Christ and I'm going to heaven. I'm in Christ. I have Jesus on my side. I'm relying on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I believe in the resurrection of God and if this body were to expire right now before your eyes I would be present with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ you might not hear it in the in the sick room you might not hear it when a dead uh, when a body goes to sleep in death you may not hear the rustling of angel wings but bless your heart as sure as I know the Bible is true and as sure as you and I know that Jesus Christ is truth and life and power as sure as I am preaching to you right now and you're hearing the voice of God when someone dies and 
and they're washed in the blood of Jesus. They're Christians. Angels do come and they do lift them up and do carry them into the presence of God. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm not afraid of the unknown because I know what's ahead. I know that I'm going to heaven. I know there's life beyond this world. I know that God is with me and, and if God be for me, who can be against me? I know that God is gonna take us and I know exactly that where I'm going, there'll be no sickness, there'll be no sin, there'll be no iniquity, there'll be no darkness. Where I'm going, there'll be no sorrow. Where I'm going, there'll be no tears and no uh, heartbreaks. Where I'm going, there'll be no uh, aches and pains of the body. Where I'm going, there'll be no sorrow and no judgment and no graveyards and no sin of, of gloom and darkness. Where I'm going, I'm gonna go where Jesus Christ is. I'm not afraid of what the future holds. I'm not afraid of the unknown because I know in whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Mm, go ahead and clear your throat. Woo! Praise the Lord. Amen. The love of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 18 says that Christ may dwell. There's this word in. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. By faith. See, we have the possession of Jesus. He lives in us. And we have the strength of Jesus, the position of Jesus, us in him. I've got a good position, and I've got a good possession. My position is I'm in Christ. My possession is Christ is in me. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted, that word rooted means planted or it means um, something like botany, growth, something planted, rooted, and grounded is referring to building a building. We're rooted, planting a tree, we're, we're grounded, building a, a building. And then it says we do it in love. And the Bible says that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. And verse 19, and to know the love of Christ. Now, what are you saying? He's saying that we should know the breadth, or that, that breadth means the, the width, the wideness of Christ. We should know how wide, how tall, how long, how deep, how high. We should know the love of God in every direction, in its length, in its height, in its width. We should know the love of God in its length, in its time. And I want you to know that the love of God, the, the breadth means the, the wideness of God's love. Think about the wideness of God's love. How wide is God's love? Well, Jesus Christ just wrapped his arms around the whole world. And he died for the sins of the whole world. How, how wide is the love of God? Jesus wraps his arms around the world and in that world is the past, present, and future. In that world is everyone that's ever lived, ever uh, is alive now or will live. The wideness, the, 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 the breadth of God. God puts his arms, wraps them around us, the whole earth and all its inhabitants. God loves and so loves us. And I want you to know the love of God is so incredible that God wraps his arms around us. He did it before we were ever born. God wrapped his arms around the entire world, taking in everyone that's lived in the past, everyone that lives now, and everyone that lives in the future. Christ died 
for the ungodly and Jesus came and died for our sins and Jesus squeezes us with his love that we may know the love of God, how wide that love is, how incredible that love is. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that God gave his son Jesus Christ. So he wraps his arms around us and he loves us. I want you to know there, that there's no man on planet earth either in the past or present or future. There is no man, no woman, no child, no boy or girl. There is no one on planet earth that is outside the touch of God's love, that is beyond the touch of God's love. God so loved everyone in this room and everyone outside this building. God loved the world that he gave his son Jesus Christ that we may be able to comprehend with the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of God's love. No man is outside God's love. No man is beyond God's reach. And then it says we should know the length of his love. From the beginning to the end. The length of God's love. Well, let's go a trillion years backward and let's go a trillion years forward and God loves everything in between but wait a minute let's go a hundred trillion years backward and let's go a hundred trillion years forward and everything in between God so loved Wait a minute, let's go all the way to the beginning and the end. Let's go from the Alpha and the Omega. Let's go as far back as we could possibly go and then add trillions and zillions and quadrozillions and Googles of years on every side. And God still loves you. What am I saying? I'm saying God loves you so much, he's just Google over you. God loves you. Amen, come on now. I'm preaching better than you're responding now. God's love is, is long. God's love is long, 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 long. The length of God's love, then the depth of God's love. What would be the depth of God's love? Well, go as far down to the bottom as you can go and then go below the bottom. And then go further than that. Go all the way to beyond time, beyond material. Go as deep as you want to go. Let's go to Jesus on the cross. And let's watch him die. Go as deep as you want to go. Jesus Christ went to the bottom and then a little farther, a whole lot farther. That's the deepness of God. He loved you so much that the Bible says he died for the ungodly. That's the deepness of God's love. And we may know the depth of his love. The depth of his love such as the agony and the suffering and the sorrow of Jesus Christ and Jesus dying. And by the way, God promised it before he ever made a blade of grass. God promised it before he ever made creation. How's that? He went deeper than Adam and Eve. He went deeper than population, humanity. That's the love of God. And then let's look at the height of his love. It reaches the throne room of God. The height of his love reaches the throne room of God. The height of his love is everlasting. Go as far to the, down to the bottom and go as high to the top as you can go. Go as high as you can possibly go and God's love is there. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that not one person in this room is beyond the reach of God. Not one person in this room is beyond the ability of God to save.
that we would comprehend the love of God. Go deep. Go deep in God's love. Go deep in God's blessing. Go deep in God's word. And let me just come to a close. Not only do we have freedom from the guilt of sin and freedom from the dominion of sin and freedom from the fear of the unknown, but we have freedom from the judgment of the damned. I was in a grocery store many years ago and this guy was using God blank, God blank, God blank, God blank. And I said, you know, you're going to answer to God for that? He said, what? I suppose you're a preacher. And I said, well, yeah, come to think of it, I am. So what was I saying? He said, well, I don't, he said, I just say God blank, God blank, because it's just a habit. And I said, well, God's going to answer. The Bible says in the Ten Commandments that God will not hold you guiltless. That uses his name in vain. Oh, you there, you're preaching to me. And I said, I just want you to know that when you say God blank, God blank, God blank, I want you to know it won't work on me. Because I am not damned. I am not condemned because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus come to stand between a holy, wrathful God and, and pay my sin debt. And I have freedom from the judgment of the damned. John 3, verse 17 and 18. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Are you listening to me? He that believeth, he that relies on Jesus Christ is not condemned. How many in this room are relying on Jesus Christ? You're putting your trust in him. You're looking to him. You've given your all to him. You are not condemned. You can't be condemned. Come on. I think back when I was saved, and I'm going to close with this little short testimony. Back when I was saved, I cussed every other breath before I was saved. I drank constantly. I was always, I was always lit in a bad way. You heard the two sheets in the wind, I was under the whole bedspread. <laughs> I'm not proud of my past, I'm sick of it. I remember one night I was so drunk, so plastered that I saw this dress waving on a clothesline. I thought it was a lady wanting to dance. I jumped out of my car and went out there dancing with a clothesline. Now, you know, you've got to be out of your mind to do something stupid like that. I will say the girl was pretty thin. <laughs> but before I saved, I cursed, I drank, used God's name in vain. I was an absolute mess. I'd keep beer and clear vodka beside my bedstand and I'd wake up in the night and I'd reach over and drink in the night. I was that bad. God convicted me and I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And for six weeks, I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. I was under deep conviction. And I asked God to forgive me and I began to dig deep into the things of God. And when I dug and I dug and I dug, it was six weeks later and I discovered Actually, there was three weeks when I couldn't hardly eat at all. I throw up every time I thought about eating, but uh, that three weeks of intense stuff. And, and when I finally got my assurance of salvation, didn't take Jesus that long to save me. It took that long for me to get it through my thick head. And when Jesus Christ came into my heart, and I knew for sure that I'd passed from death unto life, it dawned on me that I had forgot to cuss. During those three weeks, six weeks of intense conviction, I had forgotten to cuss. I had forgotten to drink. I had forgotten to do all those things. I didn't know it, but in the process of my conviction, I was being delivered. 
I preached my first revival six weeks after I was saved. That's fast. First revival. I only had one sermon. Y'all going to hell if you don't have Jesus. That was my first sermon. Monday it was, you're going to hell without Jesus. Tuesday it was, you're going to hell without Jesus. Wednesday it was, you're going to hell without Jesus. Thursday, you're going to hell without Jesus. The guy come up to me and said, can't you do something a little different? So Friday I said, you're going to fry and sizzle in the fires of hell without Jesus. He come up to me on Friday and he said, that was different. I only had one sermon. Sometimes I wish that I'd have stuck to that one. <laughs> but anyway, got a lot of results. People need to hear the truth. But I've been saved from the condemnation of sin. And Jesus saved me and gave me eternal life, and I'm in Christ. In Christ. I went to Crocker, Missouri to hold a revival. It was one of the first revivals. It wasn't the first one, but about a uh, third or fourth revival I held. I went to Crocker, Missouri, and I preached. Every night it was, you're going to hell. Every night. The Monday night it was. Tuesday night it was. Wednesday night it was. Yeah, every night. And kids started coming from the school in Crocker, Missouri. Kids started coming from the school as soon as they got out of school and coming to the church saying, hey, hey, mister, you the hell preacher? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm, I'm the hell preacher. He said, tell me about this. I want to go to heaven. And I don't know how many people I led to Jesus Christ that just heard about the hell preacher. One of the best revivals I had, 26 people saved in that revival. 26 people saved in a period of about five, six days, and God moved gloriously, and I only had one sermon. What was it? And I took 26 people down to the river to baptize them. And so I gave a little message at the baptism. What was it? without Jesus. And I remember we took him out in the car, uh, out in the river under car headlights because it was nighttime. And we baptized 26 people. Because I had one message, what was it? Well, I'm not going there. Jesus saved me. I'm glad that I'm a child of God. I'm glad that Jesus came into my heart. And sometimes it takes some yelling. You say, well, preacher, you yell too much. Sometimes it takes something to just keep people listening. Amen? I never will forget old Tom Malone was preaching revival years ago. Tom Malone's already with Jesus in heaven right now. But Tom Malone is a young preacher. He preached in these old country churches where they raised the windows and they had fans blowing. They had the fans like this. And it was just an old country church. And he said the place was packed. And he said there was probably 200 people there. And he said, I got up and preached and I preached. And he said, I preached heaven and they didn't move. He said, I preached Jesus good and they didn't move. He said, I preached on hell and they still didn't move. He said, I just preached myself plumb out. And he said, while I was preaching, getting ready to give the altar call, he said, an old hound dog had crawled under the church floor and got under the church floor and got stuck. 200 people in the little country church, it's hot, they're sweating, and he, he said, I have preached my heart out. And he said, all of a sudden, And he said, do you hear that hound dog? That's what you're gonna sound like in the fires of hell. Oh, oh, oh! He said, I'm telling you, you're gonna cry like that in the fires of hell. He said, I had 60 people saved. <laughs> because of a 
hound dog. He said, I looked for two weeks trying to find that dog because you're going to give him part of the offering. Couldn't find him. <laughs> now, let's just be honest and very clear about the message. Yes, there is a hell. But God loves you so much that he came and took the penalty of sin and he died for you on the cross of Calvary. How many ever heard the statement? I shared this with Chuck the other day. How, uh, this morning, I shared it the other day. I shared it this morning with Chuck in the office. How many heard the statement that Jesus Christ came not to uh, do away with the law? He came to fulfill the law. That's what the Bible says. That Jesus came to fulfill the law. You know, when we read that, we automatically think in our mind, well, he came and he, he said, I ah, see, thou shalt not steal. He checked that off. I see. Uh, love God, but uh, he checked that off. We think Jesus went through doing all the checkpoints and kept the law. Well, he did keep the law, and he was the spotless lamb of God, but that is not how Jesus fulfilled the law. The law says the soul that sinneth shall surely die. The law says the wages of sin is death. The law says you're gonna die if you break the law. That's the law. How did Jesus fulfill the law? He didn't fulfill it just in the fact that he was pure and holy, though he is and he's a spotless lamb of God. But Jesus fulfilled the law by dying on our behalf. The law condemns us to death and Jesus went to the cross and took my death. That's how he fulfilled the law. I mean, come on. Then I'm going to go down here to the graveyard and dig up people that's committed crimes and drag them out of the casket and take them up to the courtroom and let the judge judge them. Because they're beyond being judged. They're dead. You can't take someone that kills somebody that's been shot. You know, the policeman shoots this guy that's not killing people, which is, that's what happens if you do that and the policeman shoots someone that's killing other people and they, I wish they could take them to the courtroom but they can't, they shoot them, you know what they do they put them in a black hearse, they put a shroud over them, they carry them out and they take them out to the graveyard, that's what happens, people that get out and try to kill people in school or shoot up the place and the policemen have to kill them to keep them from killing other people, once they're wrapped in that shroud, put in that hearse and taken away and put in the graveyard they're beyond judgment they're past the judge. They're past the condemnation. They're past the execution. You can't go dig them out of the graveyard, take them to the judge, find them guilty, and then kill them again. And Jesus Christ came to the cross of Calvary, took my sin, died on the cross on my behalf, and you can't kill me again. The law has been fulfilled. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. Yeah. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. Go in deep. Get deep in Jesus. Get deep in Jesus. Go in deep. Learn everything you can about Jesus. Get in deep with Jesus. Go to Jesus Christ. Learn about him. Look to him, trust him, get in deep. I'd venture to say this is how deep you ought to get in. You ought to come to an altar, ask Jesus Christ to forgive you, repent of your sin, tell God you're sorry. You ought to, go be, you ought to be water baptized. You ought to confess Jesus before your neighbors and your friends. Make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Stay in church, live for God, honor God, and do what God's called you to do and live that life that you should live for Jesus Christ. That is what you should do and that's what you call getting in deep with Jesus. Get in deep with Jesus. Amen? Come on. Get in deep with Jesus. Launch out and let down your net and God's going to give you wonderful spiritual blessings. For the deep things of God are revealed to us through the Spirit of God. Altars open. Without Him I could do nothing. Come on, I think there's, well, I know there's people in this room. Without
that needs to come to an old fashioned altar. I know there's people in this room that you need to come down here to an altar and get in deep. Get in deep. Get deep in Jesus. Get deep in God's love. Get deep in God's mercy. Get deep in God's forgiveness. Get in deep. Get in deep. The altar's open. You come. I wonder so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. And praise the Lord, I saw the light. Sing it. When I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. And praise the Lord. And just like the blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears, I claim for my own. And like the blind man, that God gave back his sight. And praise the Lord, I saw the light. Sing with me. Oh, and I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. And praise the Lord, I saw the light in me. And I was a fool to wander astray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. And praise the Lord, I saw the light. Come on. Oh, and I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy. Hello, this is Josh Akins, the associate pastor here at Ozark Full Gospel Church. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. I trust that you've been blessed by God's Word. I want to take just a moment to invite you out to one of our services here at Ozark Full Gospel Church. Our service times are every Sunday morning at 11 a.m., every Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, and our midweek service on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. Our church is located at 3081 Selmore Road here in Ozark, Missouri. That's 3081 Selmore Road right here in Ozark, Missouri. Once again, I'd like to thank you for tuning in today. Be sure also to check us out online on social media, Facebook, and you can subscribe totally free of charge to our YouTube channel. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. Join us again next week at this same place, at this same time where we are touching the Ozarks with Jesus Christ. Surrender.